You're listening to The Brand Compass, conversations to navigate your way to building a brand fit for purpose and poised for success. Here's your host, Shelley Rosland. Well, hello there, and thank you for choosing to listen to this episode today. You will not regret it, I promise. This is a show where we chew the fat on topics that affect where your brand meets the humans you serve. So I'm Shelley, and I'm your host on this conversational journey, and boy, do I have a trip for you today. I've invited one of my really talented and smart friends to come and share his insights with you on the topic of how to identify the thing that you will be known for or that you want to be known for. In 2005, uh, 15, sorry, not 2005, I attended a, a social media event held in Manchester, which promised to have Mari Smith on stage. So if you don't know who Mari is, she's one of the front running original thought leaders in the social media marketing space. So while I went for Mari, I stayed for everyone else. It was a great event. I was so glad that I went because the people I met there really kick-started my deep professional relationships with some key people in my business lifeboat, and one of those is Ian Anderson Gray. So let me give you a bit of background to Ian so that you have a feel for the context for bringing him into the conversation today. Ian is the founder of the Confident Live Marketing Academy, and is the host of the Confident Live Marketing Podcast. He helps entrepreneurs to level up their impact, authority, and profits by using live video confidently. He is also the co-founder of Select Performers, a family-run web agency, and is the voice behind his seriously social blog, which focuses on live video and social media tools. He's an international speaker, having spoken at Social Media Marketing World in San Diego, Content Marketing World in Cleveland, and many others. People can work with him in a one-to-one capacity, as a trainer or a consultant, or inside his Content Marketing Academy in a group environment. He has a real passion for making the techno babble of live video and social media marketing easy to understand. So Ian's married to Helen and is dad to two children and all of them are very musical and it makes for a very busy household with lots of musical instruments and technology in their house near Manchester in the UK. Welcome Ian. Thank you Shelley, that's probably one of the most comprehensive introductions I've ever had so thank you. (laughs) Context and perspective, very important. (laughs) So shall we kick off the conversation Ian by asking um, you to maybe give us a little insight side into how did you actually end up on that stage in Manchester talking about social media platforms when actually you're a highly experienced and trained performing musician? (laughs) Yeah, it's a very bizarre thing. And I mean, that conference was amazing. Um, So many good friends, including yourself, uh, that I met there. But yeah, my background is music. My my mum was an opera singer. And with, uh, music was very much part of my life. I was a cellist. I played the piano. I sang. Uh, and when I was at school, it, you know, coming into sixth form, I was really interested in science as well. So technology. In those days, you know, we had BBCs and um, I don't know, what, what were the computers back then? You know, they, they weren't like what we have today. The internet wasn't really around. And so I had to make the decision. What, what do I do? Do I, do I go with my, like my passion of music or do I go into science and, and music one. And I went to university to study music. And then I went to the Royal Northern College of Music to train as a professional classical singer. And really, it was, it's just kind of falling in falling into it and, and following my passions, really. Um, I didn't have any kind of thought about a career. And when I left music college, this was when the, the web started to become more of a big thing. This is in the, uh, well, the early 2000s, really. And my dad was retiring at the same time. Uh, we decided to um, to put a business together, and this was Select Performers. We did uh, it was a web agency. We were going to build websites for musicians, and we did that. But we quickly realised musicians don't have <laughs> any money, so we broadened that out, and we we did websites for uh, businesses as well. And I was singing professionally around the country, you know, singing the bass solo in Handel's Messiah and things like that. 
uh, which was great fun. And I was teaching. I ended up teaching at some very prestigious schools and, and places like the junior school at the Royal Northern College of Music. But fast forwarding until about 2011 is when I had been beating myself up for quite a while about wanting to write a blog, but I never managed to get started. And in 2011, I started my blog uh, at iag.me. And I wrote this article called Seven Reasons Not to Use Hootsuite because I was interested in social media. I was interested in technology and the tools behind it. And I looked around and I saw a lot of the the blog posts out there were talking really like overly positive about things. And mm. I think they were all about affiliate links. They were all about getting the money in. And, and I wanted to be, to write something that was a little bit more truthful, a little bit more like, okay, Hootsuite's great, but let's look at the, Realistic what's not so good stuff. about it. Mm. And so the article was aiming, although it's got a, you know, controversial title, it was always meant to be like a balanced view on this. And, it was very detailed and it, it basically went viral and <laughs> it was amazing. I didn't, I'd didn't. i had no plans to monetize this website. I was just doing it as, as a bit of fun. So I started to write more articles uh, and fast forward until about uh, 2014 when uh, this person called Emmerich Erno, who is the uh, CEO of a rival company to Hootsuite, got in touch with me and really liked my articles and saw something in me that I didn't see myself. I was very much down on myself thinking, oh, well, I'm just dabbling with this blog post, uh, this, this blog. Um, but he saw something in me and he said, you should go to social media marketing world. And so I did in 2015. I did something that was really scary for me, going to the other side of the world in San Diego uh, in 2015. And that was a massive epiphany moment for me where I met loads of really cool people. And then I got asked to speak at this conference in Manchester called the Big Social Media Conference because um, people um, in the Manchester area, the, uh, the, it was, was pro-Manchester is the name of the company, saw what I was doing and really liked it. And so they uh, invited me there and that's where I met you and the rest is history. So <laughs> that's wow. how it all so, started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the reason I wanted to bring you into the conversation today and was because obviously I've been following following you since then so it's like seven plus years the point of us recording now right what I'd really love is for you to share how today you have this special focus on live video which you are well known for and I think anybody listening will empathize with trying to work out how you stand out or how you narrow your focus to a specific area or topic that you can be easily recognized for. So basically, how did you find what your magic topic or specialist area is? Because you went from wide social media tools down to live video. Mm. So talk me through how that happened. Well, I wish I could say it was like a really simple move, but as I've probably alluded to so far, it, it, it wasn't. You know, at school, I was thinking, well, who am I? Am I musician, a tech guy, yeah. scientist, and, and then social media. And I, I, I found those two things like very different and I couldn't like decide how to put myself forwards. Uh, and so in 20, uh, I went, mentioned in 2015, I went to Social Media Marketing World. Uh, the following year, I was asked to speak on um, that Social Media Marketing World, which was amazing. I, I was asked to speak on Twitter. Uh, but that year in 2016 is when Facebook Live came about. And yeah. I'm always really interested in do, how to do things. And so I wanted to learn, well, how do I broadcast to this new cool tool? Well, I had an Android phone. It was only available on iOS at the time. And it was also only available in the US. And being in the UK, that was a bit of a bit annoying. But I did some research and I found you could indeed broadcast from your computer using this tool called OBS Studio. And so I looked into how to do it. But the frustration that I had was that it was just really complicated to, to do. wasn't very user-friendly at no, all. No. <laughs> it was horrendous. And we forget that because live video is so easy these days. But in those days, you had to yeah, jump. Yeah, just press a yeah, button. Yeah, you had to jump through a lot of hoops. I, so I, I ended up writing an article um, on how to do this because one thing that really annoys me is when, um, you know, techie people – they, they enjoy the tech so much that they, they don't do a good job, <clears throat> excuse me, they don't do a good job at explaining it to normal people. And so I went out of my way to make this article as simple as possible um, for people, but in depth. And I even wrote a little 
uh, built a little tool to help people to go live using OBS because it wasn't easy at the time. Uh, and mm. that article has had over 7 million page views. It went completely mad. That's ridiculous. I know, absolutely oh nuts. And I was able to launch my course from that uh, on how to broadcast and uh, sold probably about 200 uh, of that. And I thought, oh, wow, I could actually make this into a, like a proper business. Uh, but there was one problem. And the problem was uh, that I was I was really nervous about going live. And so I was yeah. very much the reluctant live video guy. And I was asked to uh, speak about live video at conferences. But I felt a, a real hypocrite because I was, I was nervous about going live. So I had to then go on this big mindset journey uh, working out um, how to actually get over my nerves in front of the camera. And it was, mm. So now this is how we get to your part two of your specialism, really, yeah. is this level of confidence. So it's not just about live and, video. And yeah. I know a lot of people are afraid of even just switching the camera on and not even being able to get in front of the camera. So so the side to live video, like, do you think together with the, the technical scariness, did it slow the uptake of live video? And then how? Yeah, absolutely. You know? It did. But it did for me. Um, and it was it was when I, it was actually when I was on stage at Social Media Marketing World, uh, we do this kind of silly musical each year, kind of as a bit of fun. I was on stage, and I had this epiphany moment. I'm singing on stage. I'm using my talent as a performer. I'm talking about social media. We're talking about live video, and I thought, wow, what if I combine my expertise as a performer and my experience as a performer and as a teacher? And as a marketing guy, and I mean, it didn't it, it didn't quite come together like this in my head. But looking back, I realized that I could be a coach, a consultant in the realm of live video with the technology. Yes, but because I've got that big, em that's a lot of empathy with the the scary part of live video, but also the knowledge of how to perform and getting over those nerves. I felt, wow, okay, that's a really good combination. And it took quite a few years because I had to go on this mindset journey and I didn't always believe mm. myself. It was everyone else understood um, what I mm. should be doing. And this is what I would like to, I think this is important that don't try and do this on your own. Do listen to people. Do have a team of people around you that are going to help you and maybe give you some insight. Because although I believed, although I, I probably did know this and I had this epiphany moment and it was kind of in my brain or in my heart, I needed that affirmation and that insight from other people who could like unpick that. Uh, and well, it's mm. getting 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 feedback, yeah. isn't it? And then just listening to feedback as well, because sometimes how you feel or how you think you're coming across is is completely not, yeah. and everybody else is experiencing exactly the way you were hoping they would. Yeah. Um, but like we said, we've got lots of little voices. To oh yeah. To, <laughs> <laughs> so so we've gotten to this point of okay, live video, and then specifically confidence around live video, but. Um, Inside my group program, we do quite a bit of a chunk of work around brand positioning. So like when you've gotten over that obstacle of this is my identity, this is my purpose, this is who I am, this is what I'm doing, you've, you've almost got to really identify how you can position what it is that you're actually doing for clients. Because the people listening to this podcast are mainly service-based, mm. micro-based businesses. So they'll be quite interested to hear how you do something again. You're, it's an intangible skill that you've got. You've got a lot of technical skill as well. But there's a lot of intangible knowledge in that. So how did you, as you know, part of that mindset process then, how did you actually then get to start to put together offers or services or things you could actually help people with? Like, Talk me through that. Uh, by making a lot of mistakes. <laughs> so, uh, so I'd launched this course. And the really annoying thing about this course was that uh, I didn't even try. It just sold. And uh, it, it was and, – and so this, I think this, is, this was a good lesson for me because I was there at the right time. I was one of the very few people out there talking about it. And I was doing it in a way that was easy to understand. Uh, and, and it was also a very simple course as well. So it, I, I think I, I can't remember how much it was like maybe $49 or something. And it was a very, I felt almost bad putting it together because it was only 12 short little videos on a page. And I thought in my mind, oh, well, in order to sell a course, it needs to be like a massive 
a massive kind of like course. A bigger thing. And of course, that's mm. not what people wanted at all. They just wanted an easy, kind of quick and easy thing to do. And so I didn't learn from that lesson. And I launched, a, next year, launched a course on Wirecast, which is a similar tool to OBS, but paid. And it flopped. Uh, I mean, I'll be honest about it because... Um, it, it it was too big. Uh, Wirecast, very you know, far fewer people were, were wanting to buy it, and so it's very expensive. Um, yeah, for smaller people, which were your audience. exactly. Yeah. So so I think I learned I learned from that, and uh, and then so so I mean, my business these days um, is kind of split into lots of different things, and and this is again what I would say to people is don't put all your eggs in one basket. Uh, because s- things can change in terms of diversifying how you earn your income based on your proposition. Absolutely, you mean? yeah. So, so I do. So, actually, a, a, f- a big chunk of my income it still is, and I haven't really talked about this so far, but uh, I, I realized quite a, a early on, maybe a two or three years in, that although my my I wasn't uh, my big focus wasn't on monetizing the site. Well, why why not? Uh, as long as I'm being uh, as long as I'm serving my audience and I'm being truthful and honest, why not put affiliate links into my blog post? And so that's what I did. And today, uh, a big chunk of my income comes from affiliate marketing. Well, I think when you get to a point where a blog well, post has 7 million <laughs> views, I think it's worth looking at, isn't it? <laughs> Indeed. So so there's that. And then the other part of what I do is uh, brand ambassadorship. So I'm a brand ambassador for a couple of brands. Um and that that's good. that that works quite well for me. Although with that, that's a little bit more of a risky one because they, those brand ambassadorships mm. don't necessarily last forever. Um, and so this is what I'm talking about: don't put all your eggs in one basket. As well as that, I do coaching and consultancy, and I I really love doing that because it's it's mm. I <laughs> I was working with a coach, so I, I was being coached, and I said something to her recently, and she said, "I think that is your." What did she say? I can't remember exactly what she said, but that's your something or other, um, your purpose. That's the word. And I said, I just kind of said that I want to be a catalyst for the transformation in people's lives. And ultimately, yeah. that deep down, that's what I want to do. And um, so whether that's through confidence in front of the camera or with the technology or with the marketing, that's what it is. Uh, and so I... I realized fairly early on that there's three pillars to everything that I do. And that it's confidence uh, with getting in front of the camera or with all the mindset side of things. It's confidence with the technology and it's confidence with the marketing. And you can probably tell it's all really down to confidence uh, because there's a lot of people out there who really have got a lot to give, but they struggle with that confidence. And so that's what I realized. That's what I want to do in my business. So talk me through a little bit of, because everybody listening will be coming from a similar um, angle in that they will be doing some face-to-face consultancy Mm. and things like that. What I do try and get people to think about is different ways in which you can do that so that it doesn't have to be a huge time suck and also that you're making sure you're pricing yourself right. So, um, So if you don't mind sharing... If you would think about like an ideal coaching or consulting client that you have at the moment, which doesn't have, don't have to name them what mm. you do, but I'm interested in the structure of that. So, you know, what does that like look like? So when you first bring them on board, what does that look like in terms of maybe a call or how does the delivery go? Are there measurements you go through? Talk me through a little bit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you don't Yeah, mind. no, of course. Just like a, you know, an ideal client because we don't, all have all of our ideal clients, <laughs> <laughs> especially when we evolve, right? We get clearer and clearer about who we want to work more well, with. Well, I think so. it's, a, it's a real dream when you do get your your dream client. And, you know, because yeah. one of the things I really struggled with, and I think and I'm sure you find this with the clients you work with, is is yeah. the working out who your perfect client is and your, or your avatar. I don't particularly like the word avatar because I think of blue aliens, but no. it's it's yes. like, who, <laughs> who who is that? And I really struggled with that. And and until my perfect client kind of popped up. And uh, for me, it's, it's somebody who respects what I want to do and is actually going to put into practice what I'm offering, what I, 
what I, I give. It actually takes the advice they're paying it, you for. How magical. Exactly. And, and I've, I've actually, I did a, a, a consultation. Like I do these power hours so people can just, uh, I, I, people just go onto my website and uh, sign up for an hour with me. And it's kind of like a problem solving thing. It's more, it's not so much coaching. Often it's more consultancy. Yeah. Um, but there was one person yeah. who, who, um, who did that and he ended up picking everything apart of what I was saying. I was giving him all this advice and saying, yeah, but mm. I was thinking, well, why have you paid this money? You know, to, if you don't want, if you don't respect <laughs> me, it was, it was, so I think it's really important um, to, yeah. this is why working on your personal brand is so important because you want yeah. to attract the right kind of person who's going to respect you. Um, and so yeah. I'm, I'm very clear with, you know, with my marketing, the kind of, well, the kind of person that I am and the kind of way that I want to work. Um, and yeah. So we have that, you have that. Um, so you got the powwow. That's kind of a standalone offer, right? So if you had someone who's like, Ian, I really want you to help me get, get my live show going. Like, I'm, you know, this is the issue I'm having A, B and C. Can you help me? So what does that look like? So do you have a discovery call to work out or diagnose what they need? And then what do you do? From yeah, them? often, often that's the case. Well, often people start with a power hour. So that in a sense is, it's like a paid discovery call in, in a sense. Uh, okay, and that, you, that, right. if that goes well and, and we click, then quite often then we'll go on to the, the other stage. Sometimes uh, it will just be, they will contact me and they want to find a bit more information. Then yeah, we'll, we'll put together like a 15 minute, 30 minute call, which is, is kind of like a discovery call really. Um, so they, we can work out what's, well, in a sense, what I can offer them, but also learning a little bit about what their problems are, uh, and then depending on the situation, uh, it's it can it can vary. So, I do I have offered like a three three sessions, so three one hour calls. Uh, I found okay. in most situations that's not enough uh, for for people who are yeah. very very. Um, it really depends on the client. So if if they really know what they want and there's only a few yeah. little gaps, then then fine, that's that's okay. But usually five, I find that five sessions is a good start. So we do a batch of five okay. and then we'll have a break and then we'll come back with um, a batch of five. What I would really, what I think, so I haven't done many of these, but one of the things that I would really like to focus on for uh, the next few years is, is more regular um so every every week uh because i think that's really how we're going to you know really make the big improvements with the whole confidence side of things yeah and i think that also i think this is also the nature of the industry we're in um you know so we've got to constantly evolve how we mm. shape what we're doing based on what's going on in the marketplace because our our industry is very much reliant on technology and the changes yeah. in hardware, the changes in software, people's cognitive ability to take on that level of change and then how we as professionals actually manage to simplify that big jump of that big bridge, yeah. you know, so that more people can come on the journey because I still think there's quite a big gap of people. I think COVID actually made it a lot better. I don't know if you felt that where after the pandemic, more people realized, actually, you don't have to be in person to do all of the consultancy. You can do stuff remotely or do half and half or give the client a bit more work to do before they speak to you. So I think mm. I think you're right. Um, the other thing is potentially, you know, it's not necessarily the one offer that absolutely everybody would get. So those two different people you were talking about there, well, actually, you have the little kind of the Kickstarter or, or the ABC package, which is only the, the three was going, look, you probably know what you're mm. doing. All we're going to do is tighten your ship. And then it might be that you have a couple of people that go on more of a transformational journey with you because creating a live show or a podcast or a regular blog, that all takes so much more it, work than people. And it's a, there's a lot of handholding, I think, that needs to happen uh, yeah. because it, it, it is a lot of work. And I think people don't realize that. Uh, mo yeah. most the vast majority of the the work that I do the coaching consultancy is is virtual it's online it's using zoom yeah. but I yeah. have to admit although I'm an introvert 
I actually do really like meeting people in person. You can actually get some yeah. good stuff done. More energy from them so as well. So I've done yeah. some, so my, my kind of two types of clients are what I call the established online entrepreneurs. So they're, they're, they're relatively experienced, but they, and they've got an audience, but they want to take things to the next level using live video. And then I've got more corporate yeah. clients. So I worked with a, a company up in the Northeast to set up their studio and set things up. Um, and I really, I really like those two types of people. So I, I, I think having it mm. also feeds into your 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 techie geek side that loves to, you know, pull solutions together and actually physically put things yeah. together for clients as well, isn't it? Definitely. So Ian, I'm just thinking, um, you jumped the employment ship back in 2003 to start the web design business with your dad. So like, that's always 20 odd years ago, right? <laughs> wow, long time. I don't know. So if you could go back in time and actually speak to younger Ian of 2003 <laughs> and give him some key advice on how to approach the years that were coming to him, you know, what, what would you say to him? It's a tough one. Um, because I, th I think what I would like to say um, would n not necessarily be easy. So I, I bootstrapped everything. I was very, very like, I, I, you know, because as a singer and as a teacher, I, I wasn't making that much money. So it was very difficult for me to set my business up. But the, the big, from a money point of view, I mean. Yeah, of um, course, yeah. But I, I think the, the big thing for me is, is mindset and trying to do it on my own. I mean, I like working on my own, but I've realized that I need people. So... What's really made a difference is, for me is coaching, getting coaching, um, working with like counselors and, you know, a bit of like therapy and all that kind of stuff is also useful because we've all got stuff, haven't we, that we need to mm. deal with. Mm. Um, but also bu building a team of people around, around me. And, and I think this would have been tough because I didn't have the funds. But one of the big differences for me was hiring my first VA, Tonya, who's based in the US. And she's been absolutely amazing. Because she basically does all the stuff mm. that I don't enjoy doing and I can focus on the, the stuff that really excites me. Um, but I, I think what it is, it, it, it's, it's really working on mindset first. For me, everything's been mindset. Yes, there's been, th there's still things that I need to do from a business point of view. And you've been a, a, an amazing help to me, Shelley, uh, with thinking about, um, well, brand identity and uh, all, all that kind of stuff. I, but I, I think it's surrounding yourself with a, te a team could be like a v VA. It could be that kind of thing. But also a team of people that are your cheerleaders are going to tell you the truth, uh, are going to help you as you go along. Mentors, coaches, counselors, people like that, mm. um, peer groups. Mm. That makes a big, big difference. And I wish I'd done that um, sooner. Sooner. That absolutely. And it was, it was only because of those people who reached out to me i was in that lucky situation mm. where people reached out to me they saw what i they saw within me what i didn't see myself mm. um and so i think that's what i would say to people that get don't do it on your own get some help so hopefully early ian is listening to you <laughs> <laughs> In, in his time machine, yeah. In his time yeah. machine, yes, yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much for joining me for t today in um, this conversation and, and sharing your journey with us, Ian. I always come away from our chats with so much to think about and I really enjoy hearing your perspective on things. And you're a, you're a really empathetic leader in the live video space and we're all so much better for knowing you and your genius and thoughtful insights are much needed in the world so please do keep going thank you <laughs> oh thanks Shelley it's uh, been so lovely to to know you all these years since 2015 how I did know, that happen I know it'll keep going <laughs> And that's it for this episode today, folks. Thank you so much for choosing to listen to us today. So did that help you with trying to work out what your special subject or narrowed topic is that you could become known for or build your own brand around? Or who do you know that could do with hearing Ian's story? Share this episode. Go on. You know you want to. Until next time, stay strong, believe you have value and make good brand decisions. Thank you for listening to The Brand Compass. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to share it with your entrepreneurial friends and help them make good brand decisions. Until next time, let's keep the conversation going at shellyrosland.com.